Graham, and welcome to my program, Don't Just Age, Engage. Now, whom do you deem as the most responsible person for your happiness in your elderhood? If you attribute it to anybody else other than yourself, you're placing a painful burden on family or friends. I'm Larry Grimm. Welcome to jo Don't Just Age, But Engage. Exploring the dynamics of aging and creating an extraordinary elderhood. I am dedicated to assisting people in doing that myself because I am a, a life coach, personal life coach and personal life. I offer personal coaching for life and faith, especially for those who have gone through elderhood and are going through elderhood. I am a, a skilled, experienced pastor of Presbyterian congregations and a chaplain in long-term care. And most recently here on the island, a hospice care for three years. I um, have worked with elders all my life and I very much believe in the possibilities and believe and want to work in favor of the good things that are coming up for people in their elderhood. When we move into elderhood, we actually move through a transition because this is a, a stage of life that's unlike any other stage. I say we have a childhood, you have have a young adulthood, you have an adulthood, and now you have an elderhood. And as with the other stages, there are important tasks that we have to do. And if we don't pay attention to them and really make them happen and accomplish them and uh, meet them where, uh, as they ask our attention, then we don't benefit from the stage of life as well as we can. Now I've identified five spiritual tasks of elderhood. The road ahead, if you're just entering your elderhood, has, will, have, will be marked by grieving, sorting, forgiving, preparing, and letting go. Grieving is a, a very strong emotion. And the older we age, the more we lose, losing friends and family, losing uh, abilities, losing our identity. It really provides for a lot of grief that's new for us. And uh, if we uh, <clears throat> try to suppress it or ignore it, <clears throat> it becomes dominant. So part of my coaching is around enabling people to grieve the losses that they experience in this stage of life. Sorting through their stories is one of the interesting things for me. I really look at myself as a professional story listener and um, I know I often hear people talk about how much stuff they have in their elder years. They have got a hold of so much stuff. They said, how did I ever get so much stuff? And why do I keep holding on to it? Well, one of the reasons we hold on to our stuff is because our stuff represents our stories. And what's most important to us is our stories. And so part of coaching is also sorting through those stories that enable you to know who you are, that help you celebrate who you are now, bring the past into the present sorting out your stories. The third thing is forgiving. And I don't mean that there's an, an imperative to forgive, but what I mean is that we have a need to kind of clean the slate, clear the conscience, uh, um, to extend forgiveness. Now that may not result in reconciliation with someone where there's been a broken relationship. Reconciliation requires at least two people want to come back together and rebuild. But we can forgive unilaterally. We can forgive others and we can forgive ourselves and set ourselves free and sell them free from uh, any uh, obligation towards us. Forgiving, then preparing, so much to do to prepare. And I'd like to touch on that today. Preparations for our external life, preparations for our expectations internally, what do we expect on the other side of our dying? What do we expect we'll, we will uh, uh, encounter, which oftentimes has to do with a religious background. And then finally, letting go. There's nothing quite as prominent to our lives as letting go in, in the elderhood. And we learn how to let go all through our lives, but it's finally the let go at the last of our, our dying process that oftentimes becomes most challenging, most difficult. We can prepare for those. So each of these five spiritual tasks 
asks for our attention. And if we are responsible adults, we'll take care of that and we'll look into those. I called it stewardship of my life. Now, stewardship's an interesting word. Um, we use it a lot. Stewardship of our resources, stewardship of our finances, We're placing farm finances uh, where we hope they will do the best uh, for the common good of, of human, humanity. Uh, <clears throat> We, we think of stewardship in terms of the earth, how we use the resources of the earth. And um, being a proper steward enable, it means that we are paying attention to uh, how we dispose of things, how we engage things in our world, uh, how we help to uh, lower the, the cost on our environment in the things that we do. Stewardship comes from the time when uh, Pigs were of value in Europe, and a wealthy person had pigs, or hogs, I guess we'd say today. A wealthy person had hogs in their hog farm, and the, in the sty, <coughs> the owner would place a very trusted <coughs> person <coughs> who he became the sty warden, the warden or the ward of the sty. <coughs> And what made his or her law, it was a him, of course, so important was that he would carry out the will of the owner, even when the owner was not available. It wasn't a matter of the running back and forth between owner and the needs of the hogs. It, the sty warden, the sty ward knew what to do. And that's why the stop steward of the uh, big sty was held in such high esteem. So we become sty wardens of our own life. We become stewards of our own life. And that is very important to hold on to as we come into, into our elderhood. You are responsible for, your, for the stewardship of your elderhood years, but fortunately you're not alone. I have a website that I would like to share with you it's part of the work that I do as a community-based chaplain, you could say. I'm building a global community for your extraordinary elderhood. And this website, which is personal coaching at life and personal coaching for life and faith.com, will give you an opportunity to look at the kinds of things that are involved in, in eldering and becoming an elder. Uh, elderhood has become a very popular term since the 1990s. I know some people, when they hear the word elder, think of uh, a person of growing decrepit, of losing so much, and don't want to be seen as, as that. In fact, I think most of our people, most of our friends and family, wait until the um, physical part of aging drags us into elderhood and we have to sort of give up wanting to be, be uh, um, prosperous and thriving on top of our phys physical well-being and other aspects of our lives. <clears throat> but I'm saying that really by planning ahead, by considering the things that are needful and the resources that are available, we can plan for an elderhood that takes into account so many different possibilities. And that's what I'd like to share again with you here today. One of the fascinating things about stewardship is that you can, in fact, plan for outcomes, a variety of outcomes. And when you do, your family, your friends, and you have a lowered anxiety level. So let's look at this because, you know, there may be things that I can bring up for you, even here in this short time of this presentation, which will raise some questions in your mind that you have not yet thought about. So I have a, a website, another website that's a very important website. It's called, it is called uh, Caregivers Connections in Hawaii. And it, caregiverconnectionofhawaii.org. And it has great information about uh, elder care. So I'd like to share with you some of these <clears throat> resources that are available 
and in doing so, perhaps raise some questions within your own mind of how you can best take responsibility and prepare for your elderhood. One of the first ones that's not listed at the top, <clears throat> but probably the most the most critical and most important decision to make is where do you want to live? Uh, now it's very easy to say, oh, I want to stay in my home. I'd like to live in my home because I grew up here and I have my family here and it's so meaningful to me. And yes, it is. And uh, planning for that is possible, but it does take some intentional planning in terms of the facility, the uh, easiness with which you are going to be able to move through your own and who is going to be there in attendance for certain needs that could be arise, could arise. So remember, I don't want you to be a victim of your elderhood. I don't want you to be a victim of your uh, aging process. Louise, Dr. Louise Aronson, uh, uh, one of my favorite gerontologists who wrote a book, Elderhood, has said in that book, people don't die from growing old. People don't die from aging. People die from disease. People die from catastrophes, things that may be more, more uh, that we, we may be more vulnerable towards as we age. Um, I often tell people, you know where most men in our culture die? Most men in our culture die in restaurant bathrooms and at the foot of a ladder. Restaurant bathrooms because they'll get something caught in their throat and being embarrassed, they get up and run to the bathroom, but don't really know how to get anything dislodged from their throat. And so they can easily can easily die. And that's a common common death for many, many of us. The other place that we die is at the bottom of a ladder. And I have a friend who told me today that last week, his father-in-law, in the midst of all the storms that we had here in Hawaii, Hawaii uh, got up on the ladder, got up, up on the roof, was clearing out the gutters, slipped, fell right off the roof. Fortunately, he was not hurt. But it's very often because of our Stubbornness at letting go, uh, the stubbornness at, at realizing that we have lost some capacities due to our aging process, that we uh, put ourselves in precarious and vulnerable positions physically. So it is true that we can plan for our life and our aging. In, in our home with the help of others who will be there with us. You uh, may want to consider uh, who would be your caregiver. Would it be a spouse? Would it be a hired in-home care person? Would it be uh, a, a, a professional um, <clears throat> all kinds of uh, professional caregiver. These are things that it's, are very important to consider. And how are you going to change, change the uh, facility of your home? Take out steps, move walls, put up handles so that you can navigate through the house without any problem. So where am I going to live is a big, big, big question. First question. And if you're not going to live in your home, but want to go into some kind of facility care, there are then several Larry levels of care that we find in various facilities. One level, foster home. Foster homes usually are two or three patients, a low number of patients in someone's home, and they take care of that those patients. And uh, you can find foster homes all over Honolulu with dedicated, wonderful people <clears throat> who want to care for aging parents or aging family or aging friends. Next is an established 
share home, which is uh, is licensed by the state, overseen by the state, which will carry have more people, more patients, five or six patients, but not a huge amount. And they usually have established criteria that they have to have fulfilled by each patient. So they don't do the full range of care, but they do a certain kind of care that they can handle within their, their own home facility. Beyond that, we move into true facilities like assisted living care. Again, parameters have to be met. All uh, capabilities, uh, uh, life skills, certain set of life skills have to be met. And then the assisted living will help with those that can't be met. For instance, uh, will the patient be able to toilet themselves? Will they be able to feed themselves? Will they be able to take medication? Or are these the things that assisted living uh, is assistance is limit assistance is needed in the caregiver. So you can explore this now when you don't have any pressures, any worries. It's an opportunity now to look at what's available to get to know this these facilities. After uh, uh, beyond assisted living moves to um, to um, to nursing care specialized nursing care, and then often beyond that to memory care. I was chaplain in, uh, in uh, uh, Arvada, Colorado for, for a Lutheran home in Arvada, Colorado. And we had an independent living segment section. We had an assisted living section. We had a skilled nursing care section and then a memory care section to deal with the specialties of dementia. So a person could actually move their, through their whole life, and many of my patients there did, move through their whole life, end of life span of elderhood. And it was very convenient for the family. We built very strong relationships with family members and with our, with our, uh, with our patients. So consider where you're going to live one of the most important decisions that you will have to make because it's very costly. Advanced healthcare directives are so very important as well. Advanced healthcare directive and polls forms are available online in, in several different manners. Uh, so important because we can go through a catastrophic event in your elderhood and uh, not be able to make decisions on your own or not be able to be consulted about decisions that need to be made about your health care at that point. And so if you map it out, so to speak, with the help of advanced directives, your family can always turn to those and say to the physician, this is what my father, this is what my mother wanted and uh, follow your will and your wish. There's a document called Five Wishes, which I personally like a lot. Uh, there are also documents here available in, in, um, in, a, in a Hawaii and uh, carry on the conversation or make the conversation happen is one of those uh, available resources that will help your family to go through the conversation about what you want in your elder care. And again, the conversation, the talking it over with family members really is important. I find my children sometimes say, no, nah, dad, we, we got it covered. Don't worry about it. Don't just, let's not talk about it. But then we set ourselves up possibly to be victims of, of our aging or catastrophe rather than planning ahead. So going back to this, there's adult daycare centers, um, case management agencies. Both of those come to mind today because I came across a young man who was today on, on online was talking about how he was the primary caregiver for a relative, had been for three years, and the relative has progressively gotten aggressive and fights with him and with anybody who comes in to help. And, and this young man was wondering, what do I do? How do I, how do I manage, manage this? Here, a, 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 
being in touch with case managers, with the system of adult care that's available in our city and in our nation, very important for the caregiver to be able to fulfill his desire to make sure that, that uh, his relative has the best elder care possible. Let's bring that back up. Again, the list provides uh, some questions that we really don't think about. You probably don't think of yourself as going to an adult daycare center, but maybe that would be a good thing for you sometime. Go visit one of them, see the kind of experience they have, the kind of community that they build and strengthen with, with each other. Developmental disabilities, our care is available, home care. I'm a very strong proponent of hospice care. Um, hospice care begins when a, can begin when a physician says, you have approximately six months of living left. And I encourage people to get involved in hospice care right when they get that word, because the hospice care can make so much difference in how the whole family moves through that six months and, uh, and makes the uh, end of life experience a rich and rewarding experience for everyone. So hospice care provides not just care for the patient, but for the family as well. There are four types of pain in hospice care that are addressed. There's physical pain, there's emotional pain and spiritual pain, there's uh, financial pain and resources pain. I mean, I'm sorry, relationship pain. So all four of those are part of the hospice care plan. And you get a whole team of people who are able to do that. Nurses and, and physicians, uh, social workers, spiritual care counselors. Home care may become a, a necessity, uh, meal services, medical equipment that need to be brought into the house and into your home or into your facility room. And uh, palliative care is a new and important service. Palliative care deals with pain. Pal, palliative, means that the, we're working to cover the pain, to minimize the pain. And uh, how often do we hear, hear people say, uh, when they talk about their dying, what do you want when you die? What do you want to have happen? Because they'd like not to be alone and they'd not like not to be in pain. And so, uh, so palliative care can be an important dimension to that in which medical assistance is brought to bear in, in, uh, in covering the pain. In Hawaii, have the opportunity to enlist uh, medical aid in dying if we desire. Uh, medical aid in dying, MAID, or the uh, actual law that was passed was entitled Our Care, Our Choice. And it gives an option for, uh, for ending my life or ending, any, ending my life with medical assistance. Uh, it take, requires the requirements that are set out by the legislature are pretty strict and very important to follow have to do with physician acknowledgement and psychological acknowledgement of well-being. Uh, senior centers provide an opp opportunities again. There's a Kapuna Power program that I've seen on TV and you have probably as well. Uh, support groups for caregivers, all kinds of support groups, Alzheimer's support groups, Parkinson's support groups, caregivers desperately, I think, need to have the support of uh, and the wisdom of families who have gone through some of the same things that they too must fall, are going through. Veteran services here in, on the island are, are abundant. And you can get help with what are the Medicare, Medicaid, and, and so, uh, so, uh, supplemental income, uh, SSI, supplemental income that's available from the federal agency. That pretty well covers the list. Again, it's a list that you can see on this wonderful website. 
You can also get in touch with character, with uh, social workers who can help walk you through it. I will be glad to help walk anyone through it who would like to ask me to. And um, again, it will provide you with some questions that you probably have not asked about your care. I guess I would close also with, with a personal story of friends and family that I have who have news that they are, new news that even though they're well, healthy and well, look well now, uh, they're having to deal with, with prostate cancer and the care that needs to be given to prostate cancer. It's, uh, it, it's important, it's important. Oh, and I, as a friend and relative can say, I want so much for them to dig into these issues and to empower themselves to take responsibility in, uh, as stewards of their own care so that they know that uh, things will be done as they want them done to the best of the ability of those who are around them. Um, again, my ministry now and, and my work is with elders in elderhood, with family members who have elders in their family and relatives and want to navigate the system that's available. Personalcoachingforlifeandfaith.com is a good place to be in. And I will look forward to having the opportunity to be a partner with you in stewardship of your elderhood. Aloha. Peace be with you.